Welcome to another episode of The Wormhole. Where will the wormhole take us today? It allows us to connect with scholars and academics anywhere in the world. I am Sharon Hack and I'm located in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm really excited today because we're going to be exploring the field of astrobiology. I wonder who our mystery guest is today. Hi, Sharon. Ah, Professor Dirk, this is so fantastic to have you join us on the wormhole all the way from Germany. And of course, Trinidad is no strange place for you because I know you have visited us before. All right, so for the folks out there, let me get started into letting you know we have a world leading expert on, astro on astrobiology with us. So Professor Dirk Schultz Makush is he's currently a professor of planetary habitability and astrobiology at the Technical University of Berlin. And he's also the president of the German Astrobiological Society. In addition, he holds an adjunct professor position at Washington State University, where he was an associate and full professor before moving back to Germany. Dirk received his PhD at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and was awarded a fellowship at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center while working as an assistant professor at the University of Texas, El Paso. He has published more than 200 papers and eight books in the field of planetary habitability and astrobiology. And I just have just a couple of them I have here. Here's actually a scientific novel. He's done Alien Encounters, Life in the Universe. This one is now on its third edition. I've also got another one here, Cosmic Biology. So he has authored eight books. And uh, um, in 2010, Dirk received the Frederick William Bessel Award from the Humboldt Foundation for Extraordinary Achievements in Theoretical Biology. His latest book, The Cosmic Zoo, Complex Life on Many Worlds, a must have. He also writes regular blogs for the Smithsonian Magazine on the theme of life beyond Earth. So we are so excited and honored to have you with us today, Dirk. And I'm gonna start by asking you for our audience to explain what is astrobiology and what do scientists do when they talk about searching for life in the universe? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Sharon. And uh, I'm delighted to be on your show. And uh, astrobiology uh, has many different aspects. It starts with the origin of life, how it all started, and also then uh, uh, for the persistence of life, where would we uh, find life today? So we'll look at the different planets and moons in our solar system and also starting to expand to the exoplanets. And we also look at extreme environments on Earth, like the Atacama Desert or uh, the dry valleys of Antarctica, for seeing what are the limits of life, how far can life go as as uh, as we can imagine uh, under Earth conditions, but also how we cannot imagine life as we don't know it. Wow, that's fantastic. So you have been around the world, including Trinidad and Tobago, researching some of these questions. So how, how does it compare the different regions and what is it that you're looking for? Well, uh, when I was in Trinidad, we'll look at the mud volcanoes and we'll look also at the liquid asphalt lake in Trinidad because that was a really uh, interesting uh, desert environment, but a desert environment with hydrocarbons. And as you know, we still found life uh, in, in the uh, liquid asphalt lake in oil, so to speak, with a very low water activity in micro droplets. So this was very intriguing. Some other areas where I look is the Atacama Desert, uh, where you have, for example, a microorganism living in salt crust, where that takes the water up directly from the atmosphere. So they don't need any precipitation at all. Or uh, uh, one other research site where we looked intensively was at Pavilion Lake in Canada, where we have microbiolite reefs in uh you know in a in a very clear lake and see how the transition from 
single cell life to macro cell uh, to uh, colonial life forms may have taken place. Okay, this is really fascinating. So the idea is to see how many different extreme environments um, that uh, life could possibly propagate in. Um, so this tells us a little bit. So can you tell us about the kind of conditions out there in space in our own solar system? Where do you think uh, some of the more likely places that maybe life could turn up? Well, the most obvious is Mars, because Mars has been very similar to Earth, like about 4 billion years ago, and then turned cold and uh, dry. But if you look at very extreme areas on Earth, where we, we have it very dry as well, like at the Atacama Desert, and very cold, like at the poles, we can get a sense of how uh, microbial life may have adapted to this really uh, cold and uh, dry conditions and may still make a living, especially in environmental niches. Um, but then Venus was probably a habitable world as well, like 4 billion years ago. It just went the other way. It went really warm and hot. And maybe there are some remnants still in the atmosphere. That would be really tough for them to survive there, but we'll have to check that out. And then there's the icy moons that are very exciting in an ocean underneath uh, the ice core, uh, underneath the ice crust, uh, where you uh, maybe have even a little bit more complex um, uh, uh, a small macroscopic life, like in Europa's ocean. And then, of course, one of my favorites is Titan, where you basically have a hydrocarbon world that is very reducing and there, if you have in any place life as we don't know it, then you would uh, look at Titan. Okay, so it's all very fascinating. Not too long ago, there was some hype about that they possibly had discovered life on the clouds of Venus. And to ordinary folks the, um, non who are not in science, the idea of life in the clouds feels so unique. What really do you think are the prospects? You said that Venus was very extreme environment with its um, extremely hot and high pressures in there. Well, about 20 years ago, uh, my research group uh, published a couple of papers uh, suggesting that there could be life in the Venusian clouds. Uh, basically, the idea is that Venus uh, early on had an ocean on its surface too. We don't know how long it uh, stayed there. Uh, then uh, extreme greenhouse effect set in. So life on the surface is not possible anymore, but life could have retreated into the clouds where you have uh, tough, but possibly borderline habitable conditions still. If you uh, go up like 50 kilometers above the surface, you have a one bar pressure temperatures of 30 to 80 degrees C and we suggested some kind of a way how uh, life could use photosynthesis to make a living there and with certain kind of adaptations. Now we now too have a little bit better idea of what the conditions there are. It's very acidic. There's a lot of sulfuric acid there. So um, at the, this point, it looks like that life as we know it, exactly as we know it, would probably not be possible, that no Earth microbe could do it. But we have to be careful not to be so arrogant to think that our life forms are everywhere the best, right? Uh, microbes on Venus, if they evolved, they could have evolved maybe special adaptation features to actually still do make a living. So we have to be open-minded. And uh, the whole idea became a little bit more uh, impetus to this, this recent discovery of phosphine in the Venusian atmosphere. Uh, that is controversial, but I mean, this is a place where we still have to look and uh, figure out what's going on. Okay, so when you were growing up in terms of um, careers that you may have thought about to get into, did you see yourself as being an astrobiologist and uh, as I would say, a novelist and author, which you've been excellent at? No, I guess I was more like a, a a uh, normal kind of a teenager, a kind of lazy and not doing too much. But I do remember uh, a TV uh, episode from Carl Sagan, where he suggested uh, floaters and sinkers in the jo uh, Jovian atmosphere. 
of course, now we know that this is, was more like science fiction, but it created, uh, I was amazed about it and it created some kind of imagination and that would be something cool to do. Okay, so you um, you have always been fascinated by science fiction as well, because it's remarkable to be um, have your foot on both sides of the camp from writing academic books as well as scientific novels. Um, so are you doing any current projects, writing any novels or books currently? Um, I'm, I'm starting to putting something together about some of my experiences as an astrobiologist but that will be a little bit of a longer project. So this will probably take a little bit. Um, regarding science fiction, I must say, that is really not that far off from science either. And uh, you pointed out the Life in the Universe book that is in the third edition. And when we put that first together in the first edition, there were certain things that the editor didn't feel comfortable that we put into the book. And I said, well, it would be a shame not to publish it somewhere. And then we can make a cool science fiction story out of it, you know, and kind of uh, spin the things a little bit further. And that's how it started, the science fiction novel, really. Okay, that's really remarkable. You know, you mentioned um, Carl Sagan inspiring you, and I think there's a generation of us, including myself, that I would be watching the um, Cosmos series with Carl Sagan, and it's amazing the impact it can have on you to lead you to a lifelong career. All right, so the popular imagination for people is that aliens tend to look like this. Professor, what's your opinion? You think we will ever run into aliens looking like this? Or what is the probability of intelligent life out there? Well, uh, um, I get this question quite often, how would they look like? But you know, uh, there, there could be so many variations. I actually, I have to show you something. This, this is a book, uh, this is a picture of my daughter that pointed like a raven astronaut, you know? And I think uh, this is actually a, kind of a cool idea in a way, if, because you could imagine too that you have crows are very intelligent. If they would have appendages like little hands on the edge of the wings or in the middle of the wings, like Archaeopteryx, you know, a flying dinosaur head then they would have to, uh, 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 the uh, manual dexterity to change things. And they are smart, you know, they are often underestimated because in bird brains, the neurons are much closer packed. So they are more, more intelligent than you think really. So uh, you could think of so many different kinds of ways. And uh, yes, if you think about intelligent life, I think there's probably quite a bit of intelligent life out there, like we said in our uh, Cosmic Zoo book as well. But I mean, I see as intelligent lives too. Dolphins are uh, uh, intelligent, octopi are intelligent. So there's a lot of different in uh, intelligent life forms on our planet. About technological intelligence like us, that will be probably a little bit more difficult. But, you know, given all the stars and the universe and uh, this vast space, so, so it, you would think that somewhere uh, there is some in technological intelligent life as well. Been a lot of um, hype in the media about space travel and in particular with going to Mars and human missions being able to go to Mars and perhaps a decade or something like that. Um, would you go to Mars if you got that opportunity? Um, well, you know, this is also an issue that they have to barge out with a family. But in principle, uh, yeah, I, I would be uh, excited to go to Mars. And I wouldn't be uh, minding, you know, to go on Mars and die on Mars, for example. <laughs> That's, it, that doesn't make a difference. But one has to keep in mind, you know, it sounds also romantic being on another planet. But, uh, you know, Earth is very convenient. Earth is basically made, you know, we are perfect for Earth in a way because uh, our evolution took place on Earth. So Mars will be much more tough. It will be not as convenient. It will be a challenge, you know, it, and you will have, have to go through a lot of hardships 
one has to keep in mind that too. But to be one of the first pioneers to look at a new world and explore a new world, who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> Nothing can beat that. Uh, you know, many decades ago, one did not hear too much about the field of astrobiology. Uh, I often refer to it as it's a cutting edge field. Um, are there discoveries or developments in astrobiology that you think has been a game changer in being able to allow us to understand more about life in the universe? I, I think the main game changer in the last years uh, was the discovery of exoplanets. That we know now that there's, you know, 5,000 exoplanet candidates we have at this time about. And uh, of course, there will be many more because one of the questions when we evaluated whether there is life on uh, other planets was always, are there solar systems like ours? Are there uh, planets around the stars or are we kind of a freak system where we, you have so many different planets around? And it looks like that we are fairly normal so that there's a lot of those places. And then you would expect that there's a lot of terrestrial or rocky planets around uh, in orbit around the stars to what we call the habitable zone. And so habitability is much more than just being in that specific zone. But, you know, given all those different kinds of solar systems, you would think that there's a lot of planets outside that would be uh, habitable even for us. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, you talked about the habitable zone. For some of our audience out there, can you um, explain what you mean by habitable zone? Well, the habitable zone is really a kind of a traditional concept that just means that there's a, a liquid water stable on the planetary surface. Um, but you could have life uh, which is not in the traditional habitable zone. If you imagine on, on the icy moons, the uh, crust is frozen, but underneath you have an ocean. So for subsurface life, you don't really need any uh, water on the surface. So this is just uh, geared towards a search for Earth-like planets, you know, so, um, but there's other possibilities for sure. Okay, so I think there's the tendency, as you said, we should not be arrogant to the idea that if there's life out there, that it is like us. Perhaps we are the exception, who knows. Uh, as we venture out into space, um, in trying to discover life, one of the double-edged sword is that we ourselves may be contaminating the places that we are visiting. Not too long ago, there was some news report of a whole lot of tardigrades being accidentally released on the surface of the moon. So do you worry about that? How um, important is this issue of contamination? Um, well, there's forward contamination, backward contamination. I wouldn't worry about the tardigrades on the moon. I'm just sorry for the tardigrades because they are slowly dying there, you know, and they are dormant, they are not active on the moon. And I think the same is to be said for a lot of uh, cases on Mars. And um, I think sometimes it's hyped up a little bit too much because, you know, uh, if there's life on Mars, Earth's life would not be replacing it or very unlikely. Because it is something like, you know, if you bring uh, monkeys to the Arctic Ocean and uh, are scared of that the monkey could play the penguins. So we have to kind of keep it, uh, kind of keep it in mind if there's indigenous life on Mars, it's probably much better adapted to Mars than Earth's life. So that is the first thing. Uh, the second thing, of course, we want to be a bit careful when we go there. We do, do not, there's possibly interactions and we do not want to have them. We want to study the indig indigenous life and we want to preserve it. So we have to do that in a reasonable way, but so that uh, space exploration is still possible. We don't want to put too many no-go or don't do it uh, signs up. Um, for the backward contamination, bringing something back to Earth, I think the chance of a problem is also very slim. But here we want to be extremely careful because obviously we have a thriving biosphere and it is very difficult to predict what kind of interactions you could have if you bring life from another planet to our Earth. Probably nothing, but even if there's a slim chance, obviously we do not want to uh, impact the biosphere and that's, I mean, the place where we live. So. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a really important concept that you mentioned there, because there's often talk about contaminating other worlds, but about backward contamination and its impact on us. So, Professor, all the decades that you've been involved in this field, um, in some of your research, what are some of the most meaningful discoveries that you've come across? What has meant the most to you, or surprising even? Um, I, I think the most surprising is uh, how adaptable life is. I mean, life as an individual, on an individual base, uh, life is fragile, right? It doesn't need much to kill us, really, you know? There's just, you know, iron rod flying in our direction and uh, game over. But as a species or as a biosphere, we are, it's really hardy, you know? Biology is hardy, life wants to live. And it is always amazing. Uh, mostly what we study, of course, is on the microbial level, how adaptable bacteria is uh, to adapt to new kind of living conditions. But some of the things then can be said, uh, even for uh, macroscopic life forms, even some animals are extremely hardy. Uh, like if you think about the crucian carp, for example, can live without oxygen for several months, you know, in, uh, in oxygen depleted water. So they, they, it, it always kind of fascinated me. Good old biology, right? How, how, uh, how hardy it is and what it can all do. All right, so we often get uh, many students who look at this program and um, they are fascinated by new fields like this. But from our discussion, it seems like um, so many different areas from understanding a little bit of astronomy to you just mentioned biology and genetics and whatnot. What would you advise a student who wanted to, let's say, get into the field of astrobiology? Um, well, this, this is diff very difficult to say because astrobiology is such a broad field. I think you have to pick something uh, what you feel inclined anyway. You know, if you're a chemist, you know, it would be great if you go into the origin of life, study the origin of life, or look at the biochemistry of organisms under different conditions. If you're a physicist, you know, uh, look at exoplanets, discover exoplanets. If you're a geologist, see a biosphere as a system, how it uh, interacts with, uh, uh, with a planet, with a geosphere. And you know, if you're into, into informatics, you can go maybe how you would communicate with an intelligent life form. You know, there's so many different things. It depends really uh, what, are in, what you're interested. And well, of course there are some biologists too, right? That are interested in astrobiology. So there's multiple uh, ways where you can look into it then from uh, behavioral patterns to also adaptation patterns and to biochemistry again. Okay, so that's really fascinating. And actually really from what you describe, it can be open to anyone who's fascinated by the questions of life in the universe and whatever field they may be involved with that it can have an input into trying to understand life out there. So Professor, a lot of our audience actually really enjoy getting to know the man behind the scientist and the, what makes you tick. So I'm just gonna ask you a little bit of um, fun questions like, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you like to have? Um, probably flying, <laughs> because I, I love birds, and what you probably saw was a picture before already. So I'm fascinated by birds, and I, I think it was just great to be able to fly. Well, that's a fascinating superpower, right? And you can fly right over onto Trinidad, right? And your right. next visit. Well, that was maybe a little bit long way. So maybe they <laughs> would use a plane, but yeah, in principle. Yeah, so you could start small. Um, as you've been through your career, what have been some of your proudest moments? Uh, that, that's difficult to say. It always feels really good to have a book finished, for example, you know? And uh, I think uh, I really enjoyed uh, writing the Cosmic Zoo Complex Life on Many Worlds book, which was the latest book. Uh, it started actually uh, together with William Baines, uh, and we both sat together at the Houston Space Center in the space shuttle that was on the exhibit floor. And we got a couple of beers too much and then thought what we could do together. And that's how the whole project started. 
And we wanted to see uh, what kind of evolu evolutionary transitions, you know, uh, would be common? Uh, are there different ways to get there? Um, so, and we came up that there are so different, many biochemical answers to get, for example, from single cell life form to multicellular life form, to uh, get gut, to intelligence, to, uh, to eukaryotic uh, organisms. And that's the only big hurdle that we don't understand is the origin of life and the way to the technological uh, advanced life forms. So I felt really good when we finally had that published and with a main conclusion that if, if a planet stays habitable long enough and if on that planet life originated, it will eventually uh, evolve into complex uh, a macroscopic form. Whether we get something, what we call, call technological intelligence like we humans are, is a different story. We don't really know that because that only happened once. And before we wrote the book, both of us were thinking, well, you know, that shouldn't be something that special. That should happen uh, quite often too. But after we finished the book, we said, well, there's something special about humans. We can't just grab it, but maybe it's something that is in fact really quite rare. So we are something really special and unique uh, probably not unique, but something that is very rare. And that's maybe also a reason why we haven't discovered any uh, intelligent life or technologically intelligent life form in, in, the, in our vicinity. Yeah, um, this is really nice to know the depth into which this book goes into. So those of you out there, The Cosmic Zoo by Professor Dirk Schultz Markusch is a definitely a great read. So Professor, if again in this magical world with superpowers, you could go back in time, would there be any scientists that you would be would love to have a conversation with? Um, you know, uh, there would be a quite a few, starting from the Greek philosophers, probably to Charles Darwin, to Albert Einstein, just to see what they're thinking to pick, the, uh, pick their brain. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think that would be the first people in mind. Okay, so that's very, very interesting and fascinating because, um, what is it, it's Newton who said that we stand on the shoulders of other giants that have actually allowed us to be in this technological and pretty much advanced scientific era that we are in. So, Professor, we will be wrapping up now in our journey and connecting through space and time with you through the wormhole. Any last words you want to share with our audience? Um. Well, astrobiology is really astrobiology is really exciting. Uh, such a uh, for me uh, such an exciting subject. And what made me really tick is that I made my hobby my profession. And that's uh, I think that's what you have to thrive. Whatever your passion is, whatever you feel most interested, that is somehow can figure it out to make a job out of it or make your professional lifetime out of that. And then I think if you're really fully motivated in that, you know, what you're doing, you will be automatically successful and, uh, and get a, a certain happiness out of it as well. Professor Dick, it has been absolutely fascinating having you join us on the wormhole to enlighten us all about astrobiology. Thank you so much for making the time to come and um, share your expertise and knowledge with us. Thanks for having me. So at this time now, I'm Sharon Hack, your host, signing off from none other than Studio 42, where we seek to find the answers to life, the universe, and everything through none other than the wormhole. <laughs>